I am blessed. And by blessed, I mean really blessed. The most blessed person of my time. My time. Maybe that's what you're thinking. Way before your time for sure. But I'll try to relate. I am so blessed by God, the king hears about it. What, with no TV, news, social media? It's a wonder we ever hear about anything in my day. I'm pretty sure that's what you're thinking. King David hears of my blessedness, and he wants some of that. So now I'm blessed and famous. From what I know about how today's culture thinks, you value both. At one point in his life, King David had nearly everything anyone could wish for. However, he was smart enough to want one particular thing he didn't have, but he knew who did. Obed-Edom, pleased to meet you. It means servant of Edom, unlikely candidate for the most blessed person of my time. Edom is the country to the southeast of Israel. Hundreds of years ago, my hundreds of years ago, the country was founded by Esau, Jacob's brother. More recently, Edom and Israel have been bitter enemies. In fact, in a few years, Edom will nearly be destroyed by Israel. The Bible says that I am a Gittite. That means I am from Gath. Probably not from the Philistine city of Gath, but one of the Israelite villages with Gath in its name. There are several. And I am a priest from the tribe of Levi. But back to blessed and famous, we have to start by talking about a word in the Bible that you have probably used hundreds of times. Holy. The word holy. The first time the word holy is used in the Bible is when God creates the Sabbath, or the seventh day of the week. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Other versions of the Bible say that God sanctified the seventh day. What that means is, God set it apart as his special possession for his special purpose. The second time the word holy is used is when Moses approaches the burning bush. God tells him not to come any closer, to take off his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. In other words, that precise area is chosen by God to serve his purpose. It is different than all other ground. It is set apart, holy. I just gave you a critical key to understanding the word holy as it is often used in the Bible. Things don't make themselves holy. God makes them holy. This concept flows throughout the Bible. God set himself apart from everything else, so he is holy. So you're thinking, okay, things, God, what about people? The Bible often refers to holy people. When you become a person of God, he sets you apart. He sets you apart. He makes you holy. God sets his people apart for his own purposes. God makes them holy. Over and over in the Bible, people are required to treat God's holy things as special solely because God has chosen these things to be holy. This gets us to the part where you can be showered with blessings, like me. One of the most holy objects in the Bible is the Ark of the Covenant, a gold-plated wooden chest with an ornate cover originally contained the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments, the Staff of Aaron, the Jar of Manna. The making of the Ark is described in the book of Exodus chapter 25. God purposely and extraordinarily gifted Bezalel to make the Ark precisely as God told him. Acacia wood covered with pure gold inside and out, four feet long, a little over two feet wide and high. It has four gold feet, two rings of gold on either side, the ark is to be moved by priests using poles of acacia wood overlaid with gold. These poles are not to be removed from the rings. It has a magnificent cover of pure gold. Two cherubim made of hammered gold at each end that are one piece with the cover. Their wings spread upward facing each other. Between the cherubim is where God met with Moses. In the tabernacle, the ark was kept in the Holy of Holies, hidden from the people. The priests had very specific instructions on how to approach it, move it, and treat it as holy. It was built about five centuries before my time, when the Israelites left Mount Sinai and wandered in the wilderness. For the first 40 years, 
the Israelites did an impeccable job of treating the ark as holy. It was carried in front of the Israelites as they crossed the Jordan River into Canaan, and they marched behind it when they conquered Jericho, exactly as God instructed, always treated with the utmost care. At the time of my birth, the ark was located in Shiloh where Eli was the priest. Eli had two sons, wicked sons. They did not treat God's worship or his belongings as holy. In one instance, when the Israelites were losing a battle to the Philistines, Eli's sons took the ark to the battle as kind of a good luck charm. The Philistines defeated the Israelites and captured the Ark of the Covenant. That's the type of devastating news that, that travels like in any era, social media or not. They had captured the Ark. Therefore, the Philistines believed the God of the Israelites to be less powerful than their own gods. They did not treat the Ark as holy. God punished them sufficiently, and they returned the Ark to the Israelites in Beth Shemesh. The Jewish priests in Beth Shemesh celebrated, sacrificing to the Lord. Some of the people of Beth Shemesh looked into the Ark. They looked into the Ark, 70 killed instantly for their refusal to treat the ark as holy. Talk about making the news cycle. Out of abject fear, the priests of Beth Shemesh sent the ark on to the Israelites at Kiryat Jeharem. The people at Kiryat Jeharem treated the ark as holy by consecrating, setting apart a man to guard it, Eliezer. He was the son of Abinadab, the priest. Wise choice. Eliezer guarded the ark for 20 years. 20 years. One fateful day, King David decides to bring the ark to Jerusalem. It's a big deal. Big deal. He goes to carry out to retrieve it. I don't know what you're thinking a moment like this is like, but I'll try to relate. You know the sound in sports? Winning basket at the NCAA championships, final buzzer, touchdown on a return at the Super Bowl. World Cup shootout in double overtime. No comparison. David and his 30,000 men celebrate with all their might as the Ark is about to be moved. I'll never forget it. Deafening, earth-shaking, history-making. Nothing in your time even comes close. So the ark had rings on its side, so it could be carried by priests with the special poles, right? David has it placed on a cart. Not what you're thinking, cart. A brand new, specially built, carefully constructed rolling transport guided by the sons of Abinadab the priest. So far, so good. But no poles. He neglected this step entirely. No poles. The oxen pulling the cart stumble. The ark starts to slide. Abinadab's son, Uzzah, reaches out to keep it from falling. He touches the ark. It, it was indefensible, irreverent, abominable for him to touch the ark under any circumstance. God had made this abundantly clear. And this never would have happened if the ark had been carried with poles. He's instantly struck dead by God. David is angry with the Lord and more than a little afraid of him. Can you blame him? He is petrified to try to take the ark to Jerusalem. He cuts his losses and drops it off at the nearby house of a Gittite, Obed-Edom. I'm instantly famous. You can bet all your followers, likes, and last sponsorship dollar that I treat the ark with the greatest respect and in the ways God has instructed, painstakingly. It's holy and I know it. I'm a priest. The result, God blesses me. For three months, God blesses me and my household. It's not just a shower of blessings, but a deluge. I am so abundantly blessed that King David gets word of it. He, he reconsiders his position about the ark. He, he comes to share in my blessings. He resolves to take the ark to Jerusalem where he hopes to be deluged with blessings. This time, King David takes the time to treat the ark as holy. 
It is carried precisely in the way that the Lord had instructed Moses five centuries before. In fact, David goes overboard. Every time the priest carrying the ark takes six steps, David sacrifices a bull and a calf in case there's been a sin. This is not easy. This is not quick. This takes time and expertise, but most of all, it takes the desire to treat God's possessions as holy. Eventually, they reach Jerusalem where David absolutely continues to treat the ark as holy. I know what you're thinking. What about me? I know that's not what you're thinking. But anyway, all that fame and blessing, surely it got me somewhere. Yes, it did. I am appointed to be a doorkeeper for the ark. For the rest of my days, I have the esteemed duty and distinct honor to treat the ark as God's holy possession. Fame is fleeting. Surely you know that already. But blessing? I fall out of the public eye and into the gaze of the most holy. Nobody remembers me, except the one who matters most. Famous? Not anymore. But blessed beyond anything you can imagine. All due to treating something God made holy as being holy. What about you? That's what you should be thinking. Nobody knows the current location of the Ark of the Covenant, so you don't have to worry about looking in it or touching it. But you have things in your life that God has made holy. Things that have been set apart for His service. The people who surround you at church, set apart. Leaders at your church, set apart. You have been set apart. Your body, your mind, God has set them apart. He has made them holy. And you have the same opportunity as me. Treat them as holy. <laughs>